and welcome to Carmen's Current Events Roundtable. Today, I'm welcoming back Adam Rubenstein, um, one of my favorite guests, and can really talk about what you're, you're an internist, and he works with addictions, and there is something that he quoted that I really want my viewers to hear. Prescription painkiller addiction is a real medical and it's a real chronic disease. And there's a relapse and it's also a brain disease that you wrote. Similar to lifelong conditions like diabetes, asthma, prescription painkiller addiction is not presently considered curable, but it can set successfully be treated and controlled. And I want to welcome Adam back to the show. And we, the last time you were on, we were talking about uh, heroin and uh, illegal type drugs. But also we want to talk about today, which is equally as important, is prescription medical uh, drugs that people become addicted to and it's the same type of thing. It's almost like the person is unable to stop engaging in the behavior despite the consequences. And I think that's really important. And it starts off usually with somebody, I believe maybe they had back surgery or they had a back problem and the doctor prescribes a, uh, a drug to control pain. And that pain drug, for some reason, after a while, the person, maybe they start feeling it's not enough, then they need a, a, an additional dose, and additional dose, and it keeps going on and on until the person becomes addicted to it. So maybe we need to talk about what is addiction. Like I mentioned, it was a person engaging in a behavior despite the consequences, but this behavior didn't start like, an, elite, an illegal or illicit drug, it started by a doctor prescribing. So you're on, Adam. I really want you to talk about it and talk to our viewers and, and tell them what they need to do and how to handle it. Okay, so first of all, let's lay out the uh, statistics. People all worry about heroin, but the fact is that 94% uh, of the addictions to opioids are to prescription pain medications opioids, narcotics prescribed by doctors, Vicodin, Norco, OxyContin, yeah. and 6% in this country are to heroin. So this is a huge problem and it's an epidemic. Okay, so why are doctors prescribing medication? I mean, I understand why they're prescribing because the patient's in pain. You know, they're in pain, they come in uh, with, with severe pain and they prescribe the drug. Um, like even, uh, could t like a Tylenol with codeine, uh, people take that, and that, and I think I mentioned our last show that I, a very, very, very good friend of mine who became addicted to Tylenol with codeine and mm -hmm. eventually got hepatitis, liver damage, and passed away. And it was just, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I said, Tylenol? Mm -hmm. And I mean, this was not even, this is not heroin, this is not cocaine, this is mm -hmm. not the illegal drugs, this is, you know, a drug you could even pick up by yourself without a doctor's prescription. Right, so Tylenol with codeine is actually, um, requires a prescription. The Tylenol component would potentially cause liver failure, that's actually what would have happened in that case, mm -hmm. but it's the codeine part of it that would lead the person to continue to use. So what typically happens, like you said, it's either a back injury, back surgery, or for uh, high school and, and college age uh, folks or adolescents, it's a sports injury. Mm -hmm. So they might have an injury in football and soccer, um, males and females, they'll go to their trainer and then they'll end up in the uh, emergency department and in the ED it's quite common that they're prescribed Vicodin or Norco, which have um, hydrocodone, that's a synthetic uh, opioid, and uh, Tylenol. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I've yeah. made a mistake because you're right. Tylenol with codeine is a prescription drug. That's correct. Regular Tylenol they can pick up. That's correct. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Right, so what ends up happening is um, 50 to 70 percent of um, folks basically who become addicted, it's actually from a hereditary reason. It's only about 30 percent of it that's the social aspect, like um, kids maybe uh, 
giving it to each other because it's fun, maybe at a party, maybe someone just sees others are using it and wants to try it. 70% of the time, once it's prescribed, that uh, individual feels their brain is soothed in a way that it never has been before. Frequently, they have a mood disorder that was not diagnosed, was not treated, and they may have found that uh, marijuana soothes them, uh, alcohol does, those are considered gateway drugs. But then when they have an injury, or when someone gives them a Vicodin or Norco, which by the way is in itself a crime, it's a felony to give someone your own prescription, right. then they like it. We call it drug liking and they go on to actually get addicted and we can discuss the stages. Yeah, we, we, we were discussing at lunch at the Bluegrass today that um, we were um, talking about that kids get into their grandparents' um, medicine cabinet. I mean, mm -hmm. these are kids that, you know, a lot of grandparents, you know, people, uh, older people, are prescribed uh, drugs that are for pain. Maybe they've had cancer and they had, the, you know, the drug is still in the medicine cabinet. Maybe they didn't finish it. Mm -hmm. The grandchild comes in takes it, they either could take it for themselves or sell it at school. Right. So these are some of the ways, you know, we, this is really important because, uh, you know, a lot of grandparents don't realize that their medicine cabin is a, uh, that's how people start selling these drugs and narcotics. Right, now, uh, interestingly, that's completely true and that is a major worry of ours that the, um, the, the rapid rise in addiction among the 18 to 25 year old age group is a big, big problem. It used to be that the uh, typical age range, the most common age range, was 25 to 35. So these 30, 35 year olds will go to open houses for people who are selling uh, a house, and they'll rifle through the medicine cabinets, and they'll find these pill bottles and take them. And I can't th believe it. When you told me that today, I said, mm -hmm. what? People selling their house, they go with their realtor, and then they ask maybe, can I use the washroom? Right. And they're not really using the bathroom. That's they're right. really. Uh, going through the medicine cabinet. Exactly. That is shocking. I, I would never even think of something like that. Well, this, this exactly connects to your opening statement about the fact that they'll continue to use despite negative consequences. The reason that they do that is their brain tells them, once they're addicted, that they'll die unless they have their drug of choice. When they're going into withdrawal because they don't have it anymore, they have numerous symptoms that are so uh, discomforting that they feel they must get that drug. So they will lie, cheat, steal, they will break relationships, not go to family events, not actually um, maintain the same friends, they'll change friends. And so ultimately, going into an open house and rifling through the cabinets or taking grandma's pain pills from her bedside table after she's passed away is to them... Uh, or when she's still alive. Well, when she's still alive, you're right. Uh, it's a necessary thing yeah. for them, and they feel uh, in their mind they can justify it because they've changed their brain during the course of the addiction and they're not able to understand the consequences of what they're doing the same way, um, but it, in fact, they're, they're ruining their lives, but they're not able to stop. Now, what, how does a physician, how can you tell if your patient comes in and asking for th their back is hurting and they mm -hmm. want medication that they're not an addict they have an addiction is there any way that you can see by their eyes by their skin what can you notice or what is there that you notice that could possibly lead to you questioning maybe that person's addicted Great question. So we physicians want to trust our patients. We have close relationships with them. It's a sacred bond we have with our patients. But the fact is we're also responsible for taking care of their health. So there's two aspects to figuring it out. One is what do we see in the patient or what do they say? Those are called, what we see are called signs. What the patient tells us are symptoms. So symptoms and signs is one half. The other half is data. So we say trust but verify. So what do we see in a patient? We see dilated pupils when they're in withdrawal. Their pupils will be very, very large, and that is um, the hallmark of withdrawal. If they're using frequently, they'll have pinpoint pupils. So you can see the pupils are not the size that we've been trained to see. So they're either enlarged or they're very tiny? Right, if they're in withdrawal, they're enlarged, and that person's going to be somewhat agitated. Their hands will be a little bit shaky. Mm -hmm. They might have high blood pressure. They'll look exhausted from not sleeping and they'll be really, really um, playing up their pain in order to be positive that they get Vicodin, Norco, OxyContin. Other things that um, we see with the patient is that they call um, multiple times looking for a refill 
or they'll actually take their prescriptions to multiple pharmacies. So that leads to the second side, which is data. The Illinois Prescription Monitoring Program is one of um, 49 around the country. There's only one state that doesn't have this, and that's Missouri. And we can look online for any patient seeing us and see every prescription that they filled for a controlled substance in the last year. And basically, if you do that and you see five different prescriptions in the last three months mm -hmm. and they didn't tell you about it, you know there's a problem. Also, urine drug tests are quite effective. If someone's telling you, I've never taken it before, I'm afraid what it might do to me, but I have to have it, mm -hmm. and your urine drug test shows that there's opioids in their urine, clearly there's a problem. That's a safe, simple, cheap test, and most doctors don't do it. Oh, that's so simple. Urine specimen. Yeah. But, it, but the pro there's another thing that kids do, too. They could go into the bathroom and have some, from a friend, some clean urine, too. They could they be can. putting, they, see, yeah. the, when, when you're talking about people with addictions, and we mm -hmm. had a situation in our family, so there we, and I, and I also have friends that have children that have ad, their addicts, and they do all kinds of scheming, right. and we're talking about they could go into the bathroom, give you their urine sample, and it's not their urine. That's correct. There's multiple ways they can adulterate it. So first of all, you can look online, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but you can look online and find multiple websites that tell you how to give a clean, you know, I say negative urine specimen, despite the fact that you've been using substances. Most of the time, they load up on water, but then they take other things to have some materials in the urine that make it seem like it is not, um, not dilute. Additionally, uh, people use what's called a whizinator. Now, the people who are using things like a whizinator are already addicted. It's not someone coming to me who's my patient for a long time who has no addiction and doesn't know I'm going to test them. But if you know you're in treatment and you're going to be tested uh, randomly and regularly, even if you have a probation officer or you're seeing an addiction specialist board certified like I am, you know you're going to be tested. And in fact, they will come in with someone else's urine in a little bag that they wear in their underpants and no oh. one sees it. Oh my so God. that leads us to do observed urine so we can watch them pee in a cup, which maybe remove some of their dignity, but we're trying to save lives. Um, what about a blood yeah. test? Would a blood test? Uh, a blood test would show and, up. And they would show up right, I mean, you would actually get the blood from their arm right, right there. Well, and you can do that in the emergency department, in the hospital. It wouldn't be um, uh, really practical to do it in the doctor's office because you wouldn't have the result right away. But even if you didn't have it right away, you still, you know, you would have it in a, in a day or so. Well, well yeah, you'd you have it in a day, but by then you've already had to make a decision whether to prescribe, and it's much more expensive. You can buy cups for about five, six dollars. You can dip, uh, you know, you, you, you have the cup and you, you remove a little um, a pa a, you know, packaging on the side mm -hmm. of it, and there's usually between five and 12 drugs it's testing for. You see the results immediately. You see mm -hmm. the temperature, whether or not it's real urine, and you see uh, what is in there now and, you and how do you know if the it's theirs though well you don't always know if it's theirs and that's why you um first of all if it's not warm enough mm -hmm. you know that there's something wrong I secondly see. if you're treating a person with medications which i w hope we can talk about medication assisted right. treatment if you're treating someone with medications there are ways to take the uh the urine cup mm -hmm. and dip the medicine they're supposed to be on in that even I if see. they're not using it so it comes out positive in the office. And the right. way to get around that as a physician is to send the urine out to a national laboratory that tests it through gas chromatography, antibody response, and other things Isn't like the N NBA or Major League Baseball mm -hmm. would use. And you right. cannot fool yeah, me from that specimen. Yeah, so, you know, P I, now maybe you could explain, you're going into, we're going to talk about some medications and uh, alternatives. And I was thinking about, there's. Uh, somebody I know that goes to a methadone clinic. Now he gets his methadone, was it a couple of times a week, or he goes in. Right. Now, how does that, now he's, he's getting off heroin, and now he's going into a methadone clinic. Isn't the methadone becoming addicted to him? And what, you know, I, you, you just take changing one drug for another. It's a great question. So the answer is complicated, but let's simplify it. Methadone maintenance clinics are regulated by the government, federal government. People who run them must buy their, buy their methadone from the government, okay? There's a set price that they pay, the set price they charge the patient, mm -hmm. and there's a set um, level of visits per, per week. Initially, it's daily, and then they spread out when they're doing well. Mm -hmm. Basically, what happens is those patients are getting um, individual and group therapy at that clinic at the same time they're getting their medication. Now, methadone, unfortunately, um, ha has uh, caused the death of many, many people in this country. So at the